Amen. Once again, welcome to the Body of Christ Christian Ministries. My name is Bishop Alert D.C. Elliott, and tonight we're starting our journey through the Gospels leading up to uh, Easter Sunday. We're going to go through all four Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, Luke, and John, and look at their unique perspectives on uh, the Gospel message uh, that they preach and the story that they uh, share about Jesus Christ and uh, the facets of the story that they share. And uh, this is going to be an exciting time. We are in Matthew chapter one today. It's only about 25 verses, I believe. And uh, most of it is going to be going through the genealogy of Jesus Christ. But I think there's a blessing even in that uh, because we hear all of these names in different books of the Bible and know things that have happened and things that they've done. And, uh, and so I want to put a little bit of um, emphasis on who the characters are as we go through. Amen. Amen. Well, let me pray. And then as we pray, I am going to get started. Um, Heavenly Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you once again for the opportunity to come in and to be a part of your Bible experience to uh, learn more about your word, to learn more about your principles, to put a word into action and to develop a stronger relationship with you through our knowledge of the word and our knowledge of the truth. We come and praise you and give you honor for what you've already done in our lives and what you continue to do. I ask that you think through my mind and speak through my mouth that those things that would be considered mysteries you make clear. I thank you for the worship and praise tonight. It was awesome. And in my head, I have a couple of themes. One of them is um, uh, you'll never forget. You'll never forget me. You'll never forget the purpose and plan that you have for my life. Uh, you'll never forget the talents, gifts, and abilities that you've graced me and blessed me with to be used for the benefit of the body of Christ. And I thank you for that. And... Um, the, the other thing um, slips my mind at the moment, but I'm sure it'll come back to me in the right time. But praise the Lord for that. Um, let's get into this book. Um, I am excited about it. And this is the book of the generations of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham, and it says, Abraham begot Isaac. Isaac, if you want to know a little bit about him, was the son of Abraham, uh, the son of Abraham and Sarah, um, the first son of Abraham and Sarah. Um, Isaac begat Jacob. Jacob um, is a uh, the progenitor of the Israelites. Um, he is known as the heel catcher or the supplanter. Um, he was the second son of Isaac. And uh, then Jacob begot Judas. Uh, Judas, in this case, was the name of um, It was the name of, well, I, I guess 10 Israelites had the name Judas. Um, and Judas is a common name, so it was not Judas Iscariot. It was uh, Judas, the fourth son of Jacob. He was not very known in reference to being an ancestor to Christ. Um... So there's not much about him specifically. Um, Judas uh, and his brethren, and Judas begot uh, Ferris and Zora of Tamar. Um, Ferris uh, was, or Pirates is how it's pronounced. Uh, was the breach. It was the son of Judith and Tamar. Um, 
Tamar was his daughter-in-law. Amen. And Zara, Zara was just an Israelite. Zara means arising as like the son, the son of Judah and ancestor of Christ. So Zara was actually a man. Um, Ferris begot Esram. Esram was an Israelite. Um, well, actually, it's per, pronounced Hezron, um, the enclosed. And he was the son uh, he was the son of Ferris. There's also another uh, Hezron, and that's the son of Reuben, not to be mistaken for the two. Uh, Esron, <clears throat> or Hezron, begot Aram. Aram was an Israelite. The name Aram means high. And he's just listed as another ancestor of Christ. And Aram begat Abinadab. Abinadab, uh, his name means one of the prince's people. And it just lists him once again as an ancestor to Christ. Abinadab begat Nason, and there's no significance uh, to who Nason was other than an, an Israelite. Nason begot Salmon, and Salmon, uh, Nason's name was the enchanter. Uh, his name meant enchanter, and he was just a relative of Christ as well. And Nason begot Salmon. Salmon. Salmon meant raiment uh, as like a garment. He was the father of Boaz in the genealogy of Christ. So Salmon begot Boaz of uh, Rechem, and Boaz begot Obed of Ruth. So, no, booze, not Boaz, booze. And Booz is spelled B-O-O-Z. It looks like it has, it can be pronounced either Booz or Boaz. Um, and the name means in him is strength. And of course, he was the kinsman of Ruth after her second husband. Oh, uh, that was, that's Boaz was the, uh, yep. Yeah. No, uh, he was the kinsman of Ruth, and Obed begot Jesse. Jesse, his name meant wealthy, and he's the father of King David. And so Jesse begot David the king, and David the king begot Solomon. Uh, of her that had been the wife of Urias. And so Solomon uh, came out of, or came from the wife that he had that was the wife of Urias. Solomon begat uh, Robiam, and Robiam begat Abia, and Abia begat Asa. And Asa begat Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat begat Joram, and Joram begat uh, Ozias and Ozias begat Jotham and Jotham begat uh, Arkaz and Arkaz begat uh, Isaiah uh, Isaac Isaac uh, Isaacus and Isaacus begat Manasseh and Manasseh begat Ammon and Ammon begat Josiah Josiah begat uh, Jephonas and his brethren and the time that they were carried away to Babylon and after they were brought to Babylon there was 14 generations from um, Abraham to the time that they were brought away to Babylon and 14 generations from 
after they were taken away to Babylon uh, to get to um, the genealogy of Christ himself. So, um, after they were brought to Babylon, uh, Jaconus begat uh, Salethi, uh, and Salethi begat Zororabel, uh, and Zororabel begat uh, Ab, uh, Abayu, and Abayu uh, begat Elikam, and Elikam begat Azar, and Azar begat uh, 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 Sadok, and Sadok begat Achim, and Achim begat uh, Elu, uh, and Elu begat Eleazar, and Eleazar begat uh, Mathen, and Mathen begat Jacob, Jacob begat Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who was called Christ. Now, the interesting thing about this genealogy, um, other than it was 14 generations from Abraham to Babylon and 14 generations from Babylon to Jesus, not only that, but it, it's interesting that when we think about who Joseph was, Joseph is called Jesus' father because he was the husband of Mary and Mary was Jesus' mom. But have you ever stopped to think that Joseph was a stepfather and not the real father? Because the real father is the Lord. And so the role that Joseph played was the role of a stepfather. And I think I want to preach about Joseph as the stepfather for all of uh, the men out there who did not grow up with their natural father in the household. I think that would be an interesting perspective. What do you think, uh, Pastor Shelby? Yes. Uh, Might be a Father's Day message. Uh, yes, yes. Amen. And so now we're down to the genealogy of Christ. Once again, verse 16 says, Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. So all the generations of Abraham to David are 14, the generations from David unto the carrying away of Babylon are 14 generations, and from the carrying away of Babylon unto Christ's generation are 14. So actually there was three 14 generation time periods. Now the birth of Jesus Christ was on this wise. When his mother Mary was espoused to, to Joseph, before they came together, she was found with child of the Holy Ghost. Then Joseph, her husband, being a just man and not willing to make her a public example, was minded to put her away privately. But while he thought on these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared unto him in a dream, saying, Joseph, thou son of David, fear not to take unto thee Mary thy wife. For that which is conceived in her is of the Holy Ghost. And she shall bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Jesus. For he shall save his people from their sins. Now all this was done that it might be fulfilled, which was spoken of the Lord by the prophet, saying, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bring forth a son and they shall call his name Emmanuel which is being interpreted as God with us then Joseph being raised from his sleep did as the angel of the Lord 
had buried him and took unto him his wife. He knew her not till she had brought forth her first son, and he called his name Jesus. Now, as I was going through, I wanted to reference back because in Matthew, you will find that there are several instances where he is actually going to refer to what the prophets said. And this first acknowledgement of what the prophet said comes in Matthew 1 verse 23 that says this, Jesus is a male child born of a young woman. Matthew shows that Isaiah had prophesied this would happen. The virgin will be with child and give birth to a son and they will call him Emmanuel, which means God with us. That scriptural reference is in Isaiah 7. 14. And so one of the things that I found that Matthew strived to do through his uh, ministry of the word and his telling of the story was to at least five to six times uh, let us know that what was spoken of the prophets came true. That the birth of Jesus Christ was no coincidence and that they were led by the Spirit of God and that is how they came to bless us with this commentary. So Matthew takes on the posture of trying to validate the scripture by making sure that in every instance it is known what the prophet said and that what the prophet said was true. Amen. Come on, Pastor Shelby, talk to me a, a little bit about Matthew. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And you're right. Um, that, you know, Matthew was so detailed. You know, he, he paid a lot of attention to detail. Um, and, uh, I love it when it talks about, you know, you know, well, you know, his, his authority, he, he, you know, he made sure he let the reader know that his authority was scripture also and, and how, you know, how he esteemed the scripture and that, you know, when you're talking about the birth of Christ, you know, this is not something <laughs> that, um, you know, it's, it's just uh, unfounded are non-historical, but it is a historical fact, and uh, so I, I just I, I I love that how he he take he's he's uh, so detailed and uh, yeah so it's excellent. Hey Amen. One of the things that I've noticed is that Matthew has a special focus on mission. Uh, he recalls that Jesus in his earthly life had a concentration on the Jews. Luke's gospel opens the door to all kinds of outsiders, but Matthew forbids even taking the good news to Samarians. Uh, but Matthew knows that the Jews first uh, is not the end of the story. The climax of his gospel is that Jesus sends his disciples to preach to the whole world. And Jesus and Jews monopolize, uh, and Jews' monopoly of God's truth is at an end. And the Christian gospel is for all people everywhere for all times. Matthew is the first book in the New Testament because it makes so many connections with the Old Testament and it forms a bridge between the old and the new, between prophecy and fulfillment between the law and the gospel and between Israel and the church. Although Matthew's gospel comes first in the New Testament, it is not the first to be written. Matthew clearly has the shorter gospel of Mark beside him as he writes. He also has some extra sayings of Jesus that aren't in Mark, but can often be found in Luke. 
uh, Papias, a historian, uh, writing in AD 30, uh, AD uh, 130 says, Matthew collected the sayings of the Hebrew language. His collections of sayings may be a missing document, which scholars call Q. Q is short for quail, the German word for source. It could be the incursion of Matthew's collection of sayings, which has led the whole gospel being given his name. Some interesting things. Matthew wants to show his Jewish readers that their scriptures have come true. To do this, he quotes the messages of the Old Testament prophets, always in the form of close to the original Hebrew and declares all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had said through the prophets. He quotes five prophecies in the early chapters, the first one being uh, Matthew 1 and 23, as we've said. Amen. So Matt, Matthew um, did a lot of research using the other gospels that were written and including details that were not included in other Gospels to emphasize the message um, that Jesus has fulfilled what the prophets have spoken and what God has said is true. And I think that's a unique perspective to have when it comes to the Gospel message overall. Amen. Pastor, uh, Pastor Shelby, any other thoughts on um, Matthew as we just get started? We can really go through Matthew chapter 2 as well uh, because that's where I think some of the meat and potatoes start to come in. You want to get into chapter 2 or you want to wait till next week? So let's think about that for a minute. Um, when when we think of God coming to Joseph in the form of an angel to speak to him, because he was a man who, first of all, the connection to Abraham with Jesus comes through Joseph, not Mary. So the scripture honors Joseph as the father of Jesus, even though it was not by blood. It was by assignment. They honor him as father, even though in actuality he would be considered the stepfather because he did not, he, he, none of his DNA was in Jesus. Right? That's right. But, That's right. but the scriptures hurled. Joseph as the father of Jesus they spoke of him being the father of Jesus and I think there's some significance there biologically he wasn't the father of Jesus he was just the husband of Mary so anything that he did for Jesus was out of love true love for Mary and to honor God That's interesting to think. How many of us as fathers love our children 
and raise them out of the love for God first. That's an interesting question. I'm, I'm asking myself the question, do I truly love my daughter and my son out of the love for Jesus and the love for God, or do I love them because they are bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh? And which one is more significant? I think the idea that someone is bone of your bone and flesh of your flesh may cause you to take them for granted because out of obligation and position, they have to call you father. Not by virtue of anything that you've done. Now, hopefully as a father, you've also demonstrated the love that you have for them and the nurturing and admonition that you have for them over time. But the motivation to do what you do is not necessarily out of a love for Jesus. It's out of the natural understanding that they came from you. This child came from God, didn't come from Joseph. So who is the better example of a father in the natural than Joseph being the stepfather of Jesus and not his actual father? Even though the scriptures allowed him as the father of Jesus, we know in reality, God is the father of all of us born of this earth. Amen. I'm, I'm just, I'm thinking about this significance because it, it says something about how we should approach the love of our children. Isn't it even now as if when God allows a woman to become pregnant, isn't it once again just like the Holy Spirit impregnating the woman? Because everyone who has sex does not produce a baby. So isn't it like God is choosing who he will allow to be parents and who he won't allow to be parents? Isn't he choosing the conditions in which the child is going to be raised so that they can eventually find their purpose and their place in life and have a testimony and a ministry to share? It's just some thoughts. And though we take our upbringing for granted, good, bad, or indifferent, and we are in all of the circumstances that other people are raised in, good, bad, or indifferent, we never think about how it was the grace of God who allowed the child to come forth in the first place. Because we could try as hard as we want to, but that does not mean that we're going to produce a child. It's still by God's grace and his mercy that he allows that to take place. Only for the reasons why he sees fit. Let that settle in for a minute. So what does that say about us as men and fathers? See, it doesn't matter if a child was born to you or not. The example, the first example of a father that God showed us was a man who did not have a connection to the child but raised him as his own. I think that's a testimony 
what we think is a dilemma, what we think is a challenge, what we think is a, 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 a drawn back situation is an opportunity for somebody else to step up and stand in that role to be a blessing to other people, to be a blessing to the children first and foremost. I think that's pretty incredible. I think that above and beyond everything else, that puts the onus on us to do more, to be more, to say more. What are your thoughts, Pastor Shelby? Brother Ronnie, you can you can hit us in the chat. I'm I'm watching the chat as well. Well, it's a, it's a blessed thing. Uh, how, you know, God God saw fit to yeah, appear to Joseph in a dream, and you know, uh, you know, Joseph decided, yeah, I'm, I'm gonna. Yeah, because it, it in the natural didn't make sense. Mm -hmm. God is sovereign, mm -hmm. and, and uh, you know, but Joseph, you know, he, he, there's a no place in the scripture where I can find that, uh, you know, he was hesitant or anything like that. Because of course, you know, when if you find out someone's pregnant, and, you know, and, and Due to the customs of that day, you know, he didn't want to um, in any way uh, dishonor her or have her discredited in any way to ostracize. He was going to put her away. And then, you know, the Holy Spirit, the angel appeared to uh, Joseph in a dream and told him about, you know, uh, the, uh, the baby that was going to be born and how that was conceived of the Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. you know, Joseph, I, I just didn't, I don't see any, any of the gospel where he argued or he, but, but he, he did, uh, his duty, um, and, uh, you know, that, that is a, a message to all men, you know. I, I like the way you said that, but I would question, was it his duty or, or was it an ask? Was it his duty or was it I ask? Well, I, I, I know I duty, duty slash responsibility, but you know the the, the uh, angel said. Uh, Said, uh, yeah, be not afraid to, to Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid mm -hmm. to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. And, and you know, and, and so, you know, respond, yeah, I mean, duty kind of sounds harsh, you know, but, you know, uh, he took on the responsibility and actually a privilege. Mm -hmm. If you look at it that way. Well, and, and the reason why I asked the question is because he he wasn't obligated to do it. The the angel didn't say, and you will raise this as this this child as your son or anything like that. God knew of Joseph's character. And so all he did was to tell him that she did not dishonor him by sleeping with someone else. And so because of that, he was comforted to know that she was still pure, but that she had a miraculous child and God knew that he was a protector. And so he knew that he was not going to do anything to dishonor her. But he would protect her and care for her and the child as his own. So he was given an assignment, which is an ask, because God gives all of us assignments, but he gives us the choice whether we take them on or not. 
And so I, I look at Joseph as a man who did not do it based on obligation. He did it because that was in his DNA. And once again, that speaks to the character of a man being a father, even though he was not the child's blood, the child was not uh, conceived of him. But he did, we were called to doing the honorable thing, but I don't even think it was honorable for him. He did what was necessary to protect Mary and protect the child, which is the natural, um, the natural DNA uh, that was in him. And I think that as men, we need to have that same mentality when it comes to some of these lost children out here. Now, I'm, of course, I'm not saying go out and try to take on a whole bunch of children that are not your own. But if given the opportunity, if we can glean anything from Joseph in being a protector of the youth and a mentor and raising the child and the nurturing and admonition of the Lord, we can all invest a little bit in the children that are around us to give us an opportunity to do something great to influence their life in a positive way. Amen. It's an interesting perspective. I think as we go through some of the other Gospels, we'll see Mary's perspective and how she felt about everything that was going on. I think we'll get a little bit more of Joseph's position and what he did. Um, and then we'll get a little bit more into the life of Christ and the things that he did as well. But one of the most significant things that came to mind was the fact that um, Matthew took the time out to really emphasize the fact that this was the fulfillment of prophecy from the Old Testament. So that Old Testament connection to the New Testament, the uh, fulfillment of the law, um, that, that comes through through the life of Jesus Christ, uh, the sacrifice that was made and all of those things, it just adds more validity to all of those things as you go through to know that um, there was scripture that was spoken about it and that scripture that was spoken about it turned into a truth that we can now look back at and see. Amen. Well, I'm excited. I'm excited to get into um, a couple of things. I, I love the last verse of this chapter that says, When Joseph woke up, he did as the angel of the Lord commanded and took Mary as his wife. But he did not have sexual relations with her until her son was born. And Joseph named him Jesus. So this further indicates that that the child that was born, who was named Jesus, was not his natural son, but what we would call his stepson. But he raised him as if it was his son. And I think that is something that we have not heard preached about very often, but I am going to work on that message so that I can preach that message. And it might come during Father's Day. Amen. Amen. Well, Pastor Shelby, I won't uh, belabor the time. Uh, we have gotten through Matthew chapter one. We got a few great nuggets out of it. Would you go ahead and pray for us and pray us out? Give us uh, and bless us um, through your word of prayer. Definitely. Lord, we just want to say thank you, oh God. Thank you, O oh God, for this powerful word. Thank you, O oh God, uh, just for your, your being who you are, Lord. Uh, Lord, to learn of you, O oh God, is, is such a privilege and an honor, God. And Lord, uh, we ask that you uh, just bless everyone, O oh God, in the clubhouse. You know, we stand in need of, Lord, and move, O oh God, on the behalf of your people. Every household that's represented, oh God, bless, touch, deliver, restore, encourage. 
thank you, O oh God, for this, O oh God, this ministry, O oh God, for Bishop, Lord, and I thank you, O oh God, that you are elevating him, O oh God, and Lord, bless the offering, and bless those who are able to give, and those who desire, but are able, in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah, that 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 uh, I know that Matthew chapter two, you know, does, uh, you know, 